For Wall Street Media, I'm Mike, I'm here with Doug, and we'll help you make money in the stock market with information you can't find anywhere else. Hey, hello there, my friend. Hey, we have a video. Yeah, Rich Gordon, we love Rich Gordon. Great integrity, great, great mind. I love him, and he's got his outlook on what's going to happen with the economy here. Oh, great. Actually, Rich Gordon discusses a policymaker's decision that the solution to the global credit crisis is a large-scale expansion of the supply of currency and available liquidity. He explains that deflation and deep recession are immediate problems that are causing uh, broader hardships and that they need to be addressed now. Here it is. Hi, and welcome again to Market Summary Online. Policymakers in the G8 have made a decision that the solution to the global credit crisis is a large-scale expansion of the supply of currency and available liquidity. The U.S. has entered a monetary regime of near-zero interest rates and quantitative easing, and many analysts believe that the U.K. and Eurozone will follow as recessions deepen in those countries. Japan's interest rates have already been less than 1% for many years. The concept is simple. Deflation and deep recession are immediate problems that are causing broad hardships, and they need to be addressed now. While inflation might be the inevitable result of a broad expansion in the supply of money, it's a problem for the future. The U.S. in particular has made the decision to exponentially expand the size of the government's balance sheet, and as a result, the trillions of dollars of debt that it's incurring will be devalued by an inflationary cycle. So inflation becomes both the solution to the current problems and the eventual Achilles heel that has to be dealt with during the next economic and monetary cycle. Investors now appear to clearly recognize that this outcome is inevitable and are positioning their portfolios accordingly. The shape of the Treasury curve is dramatically steeper over the past two weeks, and the 10-year yield closed higher each day during that period. But the most telling move in the financial markets has been the rally in gold, which last week broke through strong technical resistance in the 880 to 890 range and is again above $900 an ounce. Gold has historically been known to be a store of value, the best theoretical hedge to both severe inflation, the devaluation of currency, and deflation, which is the devaluation of assets. During the unprecedented expansion of credit availability and liquidity between 2003 and 2007, gold got stripped of a part of its true nature. It was bought by investors who used leverage to augment their net returns. Commodities became another financial asset class and were made a part of supposedly diversified portfolios of other financial assets. The problem, of course, is that as each of these supposedly diverse asset classes became subject to the leveraged flows of capital in the worldwide financial system, they lost a lot of their individuality and with it their diversification value. However, as the values of assets are undergoing their most severe repricing in decades, their intrinsic characteristics are returning, and this is more apparent in gold than any other asset class. The chart shows the performance of gold versus all commodities since the middle of last year. Gold has held its value, while the broader commodities index has lost almost 50 percent. This makes sense since the demand for commodities should in large part be driven by global GDP, whose growth rate is currently slowing. It appears that as the world's central banks attempt to reflate their economies to devalue the debt that they've added to their balance sheets, gold stands to benefit. Over the past two weeks, as the 10-year Treasury yield has risen and the curve has steepened, gold has gained 11 percent against a broad basket of currencies. It's really part of the same market dynamic, the re-emphasis on the eventual economic effects of the supply of money and the size of the government's balance sheet. This is illustrated in the chart. It's a correlation analysis of the 10-year Treasury yield and the price of gold. In the year prior to January 12th, the two displayed almost no correlation. But since then, the daily correlation has been almost 78 percent. The importance of this exercise isn't really to determine whether or not gold is a buy. There will be some savvy investors, both institutions and individuals, who will capitalize on increases in the prices of precious metals if and when inflation does become a persistent fixture in world economies. It seems much more important that this early move in gold might foreshadow eventual price increases in other hard assets 
and the one we're most focused on is the price of residential real estate. The collapse of the prices of subprime mortgage assets in the U.S. became the canary in the coal mine that led to the forced deleveraging of the worldwide credit markets. The subsequent decline in the prices of residential real estate helped create a negative feedback loop that has caused banks to tighten lending standards and reduce credit availability for a broad spectrum of both consumer and commercial loans. With banks and GSEs holding trillions of dollars worth of supposedly prime mortgage paper, there can be little doubt that home prices are going to have to stabilize before banks can get comfortable enough to believe that they have adequate loss reserves and begin to ease their lending standards. According to the Case-Shiller Index, home prices in the U.S. have now fallen 25 percent from their peak in July of 2006. The question is how much further there is to go. The chart shows a much longer-term view of home prices in the U.S., the median sales price on existing homes adjusted for inflation back to 1968. The true value of homes is a function of a lot of different factors, including rental value, population growth and demographic changes, and overall affordability, which in turn is a function of mortgage rates and availability. While the inherent value of real estate is always difficult to assess, the actual value is nothing more or less than the amount that a buyer is willing to pay for it at any given point in time. The red trend line shows that over the past 40 years, real estate prices have sustained a general upward trend of a little over 1% a year on average after adjusting for inflation. We take this to mean that the underlying economic value of homes in the U.S. has increased by approximately that amount. Here are a couple of points. First, the growth in the price of homes during the period between 2003 and 2006 was unprecedented, and home prices ballooned more than 40 percent higher than the level representing long-term sustainable economic value. Second, the massive correction is still going on and has driven prices almost back to this long-term trend line. Given the depth of the deleveraging that's underway, and the large shadow inventory of homes and apartments both for sale and rent, it wouldn't be surprising to see prices overcorrect and move lower than this trend line. But it also shows that prices are now a lot closer to levels that would appear to be sustainable over long time frames. In other words, residential real estate is being stripped of its financial and investment component and returning to its essence as a hard asset rather than a financial one. If the price of gold is really an indicator of a rotation in investor preference for hard assets versus financial assets as a hedge against devalued currency and potential inflation, then this dynamic may be the key to the eventual return to health of the credit markets. Over the next few weeks and months, we'll watch closely to see if gold prices keep heading higher and home prices begin to show some signs of finding a floor. And we're back. Hey, I love Rich Gordon, man. Um, I have to tell you, I don't think uh, today's stimulus, I think, is kind of like uh, the Wizard of Oz, right, where it's, don't look at the man behind the curtain, <laughs> right? I don't think, you know, there were 75,000 people laid off Monday, right? All of the companies were reporting. Yahoo reported this week they were only down $500 million. Last year they made $300 million. This quarter they lost $200 million, mm -hmm. right? American Express last year made 800 and some million now they this this quarter they had 100 million right and, and the earnings season is not even over yet right and all of the earnings are that horrible um now both of their stocks were up right because we're in insanity land um uh verizon however uh, reported a 15 percent increase oh, wow. um and their stock is of course down right down um, Makes sense. Guys, Rich Gordon has given you the view of somebody longer term, and he's brilliant and wonderful. If you're looking for a shorter term view, you've got to take a look at stock toots where I've been jumping in and out of things. Man, I have mm -hmm. never traded so quickly and owned so little stocks at any one given moment mm -hmm. uh, than I have right now because I don't think the stimulus is going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Out of all these trillions and trillions of dollars we're going to hand away, right, to the people that were the failures, right, the banks that weren't responsible and the consumers that weren't responsible. Did you know something like, I think it's one-thirtieth of, of the stimulus package will actually be spent this fiscal year? Oh, really? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. I think it's 20 or 30 billion actually gets spent this fiscal year. Oh, wow. Out of all the hundreds of billions that you hear, 
you know. So what's happening with all the other money? Because the money gets released right away, right? No, so someone is sitting on the money. It, well, it's all printed money anyhow. It's not coming from anywhere. Right. We're a debtor nation, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just phony baloney anyhow. We ought to have a stimulus. Can we have a printer? Uh, <laughs> anyhow, guys, um, I made some money yesterday uh, in, in double shorting gold, which I got from uh, Stock Twits, mm -hmm. right? And I'm looking for the next idea right now. Great. Yeah, it's fabulous, guys. But I, I, I would own very, very little. Uh, the only thing I did today so far was, and the ETFs do not deliver as promised, right? Whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did buy some BGZ just to, sh uh, it's a triple short mm -hmm. on the general market. So you wouldn't market. get the triple? Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, you don't. Mm -hmm. the mar if the market falls, like I expect it to when people realize that it's the man behind the curtain, it's not actually the great Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. um, it, it, they don't deliver as they should. Okay. You know? Why is that? Because isn't they're, they're not, yet? no, they're improperly managed. Uh, okay. okay. Um, DXO, I still own long. I expect oil to come back up. Everybody needs to use your oil. And I own some ATVI, and that's all. This mm -hmm. is the least that I've ever owned. It, it, and I've been jumping in and out, picking a slice here and there, right, from ideas I get on stock twits. Um, but not too much else, guys. Be, be careful out there. I think things are a lot worse uh, th than anybody's letting on to you. Okay, great. That's all we have for now. We're here every day at Wall Street Media. You can find us directly at wsmco.com. Thanks.